I have a question. Do you guys ever try to push some code and then get hit with this message? But whatever, it's not too bad. Just set up the flags for git merge and try again. But what do you know, the message is back and so you just go for it and set the rebase flag. Nothing bad should happen, right? Before you know it, you've lost your company $1.6 billion, half of the production code is gone and all you can hear is... Maybe it's just me who has these bad dreams. Regardless, if anything remotely close to that has happened, sorry, but that's a skill issue, and you need to get good. Now that the bad puns are out of the way, after this video, you'll have nothing to worry about, and rebase will just be like every other git command. Git is a version control software that allows you to take snapshots of your code at different times. It was invented by Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. Git is super useful for keeping track of the state of your code and can increase your overall software development productivity. We'll start off with simple commands like git add and then work our way towards more complex git commands. To get started, open up the folder you want to track with version control and run git init. This initializes the local git repository, not to be confused with the repository on GitHub, which I'll get to later. With an empty git repository, we can start tracking our files. To track or stage individual files, we can run git add and then the file name. If we want to add all the files, we can run git add with a period. Now, to see which files are staged and ready to be committed, we can run git status. Here, you can see that main.c, monkey.c, and a .env file are currently staged. I always run git status before a commit just to make sure my commit has all the correct files. Finally, to commit these changes, we can run git commit with the dash m flag to provide a message. Congratulations, you're now one step closer to pushing untested code to production. You might have noticed that we just made a pretty bad mistake by committing our env file. And this happens more often than you think, especially once you get the hang of git and start creating hundreds of commits. In order to stop this from happening again, we can create a git ignore file, and then place the .env file in it. A git ignore file prevents any file or file path from being staged and committed. It's a good idea to set this up when you initialize a git repo to prevent accidents like this from happening again. Before we go any further, if you do accidentally commit something that should not have been committed, you can go back to a previous commit through git reset. In this case, we're going to go back one commit, as that's when we committed our .env file. This isn't to be confused with git revert, which creates a new commit to undo the changes. You might also find yourself having to use git reset hard, which is useful but can be dangerous, as it not only goes back to a previous commit, but also wipes out any uncommitted changes. While staging and committing files seems great and super cool, the real power of Git comes in the form of its branching system. Branches allow multiple people to work on separate features without them interfering with each other's code. That way, you can have a clean production branch and separate branches for pre-production, new features, and more. Currently, we've just been working on the main branch, but we can create others as well. To create a new branch, we can use the git branch command. And to move over to the branch, we can just use git checkout. There's also a shorthand notation that combines the steps, which is just git checkout with the dash b flag. Inevitably, when all the features in branches apple, banana, carrot, and others are completed, they have to be brought back into the main branch. To do that, we can take advantage of git's powerful merge capabilities. Git merge essentially puts a forked history back together. It does so in a couple different methods. The first of which is a fast forward merge, which happens when the branch you're merging into has not been altered or hasn't diverged from the merging branch. We can also merge with no fast forward even when a fast forward is available. This creates a commit that shows the merge actually happened. The second type is a three-way merge, which is the default way git merges branches. It finds a common ancestor between both branches and makes a new commit on the main branch that has the changes from both branches. Many times, with this merge, you'll come across a merge conflict, and I'll get into how to resolve that in just a second. The third type is a squash merge, which is similar to a fast forward merge, but rather than cluttering main with a whole bunch of commits, we can also condense the changes down into one commit. And finally, we have the frightening rebase. Basically, all a rebase does is it rewrites the history. If we want the commits on our feature branch to appear after the commits on our main branch, we can use a rebase. It's really that simple. Coming back to the merge conflict, you'll see this message, conflict merge conflict, and also automatic merge failed. The reason this happens is Git doesn't know which version to keep, or even if it should keep both versions. To fix this, we can go into the file where the merge conflicts reside, and at first, it might look a bit confusing, but I promise it's not that bad. 
There's three sets of markers here, the arrows with head, the equal signs, and the arrows with the banana. The first set of arrows signify the start of the merge conflict, and all the code up until the equal signs is the code from the current branch. The code from the equal signs to the second set of arrows is the code from the merging branch. To fix this, we can decide which piece of code we want to keep, or even keep both, and then remove all the git markers. While this is a simple example, git merges can get pretty complicated, and using a code editor can make the process much easier, as they can parse out the markers and give you a GUI for fixing the merge conflict. It's also a good idea to make smaller commits and merges so you don't have to deal with a super complex merge conflict. Before we switch over to the GitHub side of things, I'd like to give you an example of Rebase. Again, Rebase is essentially just rewriting history. If we're in our feature branch, which is behind the commits of the main branch, and we want those commits from the main branch, we can also use a Rebase. From the feature branch, we can call git rebase main. With the rebase, git still tries to merge the code and you may get a merge conflict. This conflict is no different from any other merge conflict and you can fix it in the same manner as we did before. Once the conflict is fixed, we can add the file again and then run git rebase continue to continue the merge and rebase. Now, when you check the git log of the feature branch, you'll notice it also has the commits from the main branch. Like I said, it's really simple, and with some practice, Rebase won't be so scary anymore. Now that you understand Git, we can talk about GitHub a bit. GitHub is a cloud platform where you can work together with other developers. It uses Git under the hood, and while there are other services that do similar things, like GitLab and Bitbucket, GitHub is probably the most popular. When you first log on to GitHub, you'll see a page like this, where your repositories are on the left if you have any. Otherwise, you can just create a new repository. And when you're doing so, I'd advise not to include a readme, gitignore, or a license, as we can just add that later, and adding it now can complicate things further. Here, we made the repository public, but if you're not ready to share your code with the world, you can also make it private. Once we've created our GitHub repository, you can see that GitHub takes us to a screen that helps us actually set up the repo locally and connect it with this cloud repository. We can follow the steps provided by GitHub by creating a readme. And for now, we'll just put some generic text in the readme as it doesn't really matter. Now, we can follow along with the rest of the instructions by the things we learned before, such as git init, git add, and making a commit with this readme. We can link up the remote repository with the local one so git knows where to push the code. Finally, once all that's done, we can do a git push. When we do the push, we'll get an error, and it's a pretty self-explanatory one. It's pretty common, and the way we can solve it is just by using the command that git gives us. Now, to download some code from GitHub, we can use git clone. And to do that, we can click this code button and then copy the URL. Then, we can run the command git clone with the URL, which will clone the git repository into a local repository. As you can see, if we go into this folder, we have all the contents of the actual git good repo, including the readme that we created earlier. Finally, if you want to contribute to other open source projects, you have to fork the repo. Forking the repo basically makes a copy of their git repo on your local GitHub account. It takes a second for the fork to actually work, but once the fork is done, we can clone the repo locally like we've done so before. When we fork a repository to add a feature, it's a good idea to create that feature on a separate branch. Here, we'll make our change by again modifying the readme and just adding a bit more information. To send our changes to the remote repository, we can use git push, except this time, a pop-up will appear on our GitHub page. To start a pull request, you can click that button that says compare and pull request. We'll be given some options here, such as the title and the description, and if you scroll down, you can see the code that you've changed. At the top, you'll see where the code is actually being merged to. You can see it's being merged from the feature one branch of our repository into the main branch of the git good repository. We can then create the pull request with this create pull request button, and it'll be sent to an owner or maintainer to review. Now, if you are the maintainer or the owner, you'll see a screen similar to it before, except this time you'll actually be able to merge in the pull request. Additionally, you can also see the files changed, the commits added, and then once everything looks good, you can decide to merge it in, or maybe even squash and merge it in. As you can see, you've now successfully made a pull request and have had those changes merged in. Thank you guys for watching. I know this is a slightly different type of video, so if you liked it, let me know down in the comments. But other than that, I'll see you guys later.